Abraham had a son of the promise named Isaac. Isaac had a son of the promise named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter named Dinah. The next to the last son named Joseph was sold by his brothers as a slave into Egypt. Eventually he rose to prominence under Pharaoh and when a famine hit the land of promise where his family lived, they were able to come down find refuge in Egypt. He was able to feed them and his whole family, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob stayed in Egypt for 430 years. During that time, they were downgraded to slaves. They just made bricks. 430 years later, Moses is raised up. Moses leads them in this large jailbreak. They leave Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They get into the desert. They wander for 40 years under Moses. Moses dies up on Mount Nebo. Joshua, his aide-de-camp, becomes the new leader. He leads the children of Israel across from the plains of Moab, across the Jordan River, into the land of promise. They walk around the city of Jericho, the walls fall down, they take over their, they reconquer their land led by judges, women like Deborah, men by Gibson, Gideon and Samson. The last of these judges is a man named Samuel. Samuel anoints Saul, the first king of Israel. He starts out well, ends poorly, then King David, then King Solomon, then the kingdom is split in two. Rehoboam in the south, Jeroboam in the north, the ten tribes in the north called Israel, the two tribes in the south called Judah. In the north, the capital is the city of, is the city of Samaria. Now Israel in the north is perpetually at war with Syria, a little bit more to the north. During one of these battles, the Syrians came down. The Syrians are also called Arameans, by the way. The Syrians come down and they lay siege to the capital of Israel in the north, to the capital called Samaria. Inside is the king, inside is the prophet named Elisha, and they lay siege. Now in the old days, a siege, although a very blunt instrument of war, was very effective. What they did in a siege was the enemy army simply surrounded the city and in this case the walled city of Samaria. And they crossed their arms and they waited. It was a waiting game. They would starve them out. They would let them die of thirst and eventually the city would capitulate. But sometimes it took months. Sometimes it, sieges could last for years if there were a water supply inside the city. Well, in this particular case, the situation in Samaria has gotten very desperate. I know that a donkey's head was sold, I suppose for food, for 80 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money for a donkey's head. And I know that a cup of dung from a dove was also sold for food. Can you imagine? I mean, this is how desperate the people are getting. It got worse than that. In fact, one day the king is walking along the wall when he uh, hears a woman and the woman calls out, Oh king, won't you help me? He says, what do you want me to do? There, you want me to go out to the wine press and bring you some wine? Do you want me to perhaps go out to the threshing floor and bring you some flour? Of course, totally sarcastic. And then he says, now, what can I do for you? And the woman says, well, <clears throat> I'm embarrassed to tell you this king, but uh, this woman and I, there are two of them, had become so desperate in our hunger that we agreed the only thing left was to eat our children. Uh, yesterday we ate my son. And now this woman has refused to bring out her son so we can eat him. Give me justice. Make her bring out her son. Can you imagine? Well, when the king heard this, the desperate level to which the citizens had fallen, he took his robes and he tore them in two. The people who were there watching gasped because they could see that underneath his kingly robes, he was wearing burlap. Burlap is the, this is the clothing of mourning. They could see the king had already given up. The king said, may the Lord deal with me ever so severely if by this time tomorrow I do not separate Elisha's head from his shoulders. You may be wondering, why is this Elisha's fault? 
Well, it turns out Elisha the prophet had been counseling the king to wait on God. That God would save them if they just waited. And the king now is done waiting. So he sends his general to go and kill Elisha. But Elisha is in his house and he knows what's happening. So he tells his friends to bar the door so no one can get in. The general gets there and he says, the king's tired of waiting. I mean, why should we wait for God? Isn't God the one who's doing this? Doesn't God do everything? Doesn't God control everything according to you spiritual people? So why should we continue to wait? Elisha said to him, I guess through the door they're talking. And he says, I'll tell you what, by this time tomorrow, six bags of flour will sell here in the marketplace of Samaria for one silver coin and 12 bags of barley for one silver coin. The general on the other side of the door scoffs. <laughs> nah, he said, even if God were to open the, the windows of heaven, that could not happen. Elisha said to him, ah, it will happen, my friend. Your eyes will see it, but your lips will not taste it. Well, just about at the same time, these two are having that conversation. It's now evening, and outside the walls of this city of Samaria, in the shadow of the gate, there are four men. So these are thick walls, and where the gate would be, there would be an archway, there'd be a place to stay. And there are four men there in this shady part of the gates of Samaria. These, these men are lepers. That is, they have an infectious skin disease. They are outcasts. They're not allowed to be inside the city. And somehow they have so far weathered this, the siege, but they too are dying. So they say to each other, brothers, what do we have left to lose? If we stay here, we're going to die. Yeah. If we go inside the city, we're going to die. Yeah. The only option we have, the only possibility we have, our only hope is to walk out to the Syrian camp and throw ourselves on their mercy. And if they decide to kill us, well, they'll kill us. We're going to die anyway. They agree, yes, this is our only plan. So they shake hands on it, turn their backs on the gate of the city of Samaria and now start walking out toward the Syrian camp. Now the Syrians have been aware of the dire situation inside the city. They can smell it. I mean, the city does not smell good after this many months of being cooped up. They suspect they're very near the time when somebody inside is going to open the gates and they're going to, the Syrians are going to pour in and they're going to plunder the city and they're going to get the riches of the capital of Israel. They're going to take away slaves, men servants, maid servants, perhaps a wife, perhaps a girlfriend. And they're anticipating the fall of the city. So now the four lepers are walking out in that direction. <clears throat> but as they get near the camp, something seems strange. Something's amiss. And at first they can't quite put their finger on it. I mean, they can see horses and they're, they're tied up there. They can see the smoke of a campfire. They can see the tents. But... As they get nearer, it becomes apparent what's wrong. They can't see any people. Where are the Syrians? So they get right up to the camp and still no people. The campfire's hot. Food is lying here. Oh, that's the first thing. So they see the food and they gorge themselves. They go inside a tent. There's nobody in the tent. But the, peop the men of Syria have not left their treasures back at home. They've carried them here. So inside the tent, there are the finest clothing. There are 
there's old, there's gold, there's silver, <laughs> and the lepers like we just won the lottery so they start getting the stuff and they take it out in the desert and they hide it they bury it they dig little holes they put it under bushes they come back in they get some more they take it out now it's the middle of the night and one of them finally says hey wait 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 this is wrong we have been saved but those inside the city don't even know the good news yet brothers God will deal with us severely if we do not share the good news to those trapped inside the city. They all solemnly agreed, yes, it is their duty. So they leave the treasures there and they turn around and they begin walking back toward the city. What they did not know is how the Syrian camp came to be emptied of people. Just a short time before, about the time when Elisha was talking to the general, saying, uh, your eyes will see it, but your lips will not taste it. Just about that same time, the Syrian soldiers were getting ready to eat dinner. And they're, like I said, they're excited. They know the end is coming. They know the plunder is almost theirs. And I suspect it was one of the young soldiers who first said, what's that noise? And they all said, ah, what are you talking about? We don't hear anything. And he listened for a moment and he would have said, wait, no, no, no. Shh, quiet down, you guys. Quiet, quiet. Listen, what is that noise? And now the veteran soldiers could hear it. And they knew very well what that noise was. It was the sound of an army. It was the sound of the creaking of chariot wheels. It was the sound of the neighing of horses. It was the sound of foot soldiers, tens of thousands of foot soldiers marching in unison. And it grew louder and louder. And now the color drains out of the faces of the Syrian soldiers. Somebody says, they have sent envoys to Egypt and now the Egyptian army is coming in all its strength. The Egyptians are coming. Run for your lives. Save yourself if you can. And they all throw down the food. They throw down their weapons and they take off running toward the north. They run until they get to the Jordan River. Every step of the way they're trying to make themselves lighter. They're throwing off anything they have left that's slowing them down. They're their clothes, their cloak, and they get to the river, they cross the river, and now they're safely back in Syria. They head toward home. But there was no army. There was only the sound of an army. But the lepers didn't know this. They just knew there was no one there. So now they get back to the walls of the city of Samaria. They knock on the gate. The gatekeeper says, what? Still the nighttime. The lepers say, hey, it's us, the lepers. What do you want? Well, we went out to the Syrian camp and guess what? They're gone. What? Yeah, we went to the Syrian camp and they're gone. There's nobody there. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, we were just there. Tell the king. So the guard at the gate shouts to the next guard, the lepers say the Syrian siege is over. They've left. The next guy. The lepers say the Syrian siege is over. They, the next guy. And now the whole city is hearing this. Well, the king, they get the king up and they say, hey, king, guess what? You know, the four, Syri the four lepers, yeah, they went out to the Syrian camp. They say that there are no Syrians there. They've gone home. And the king says, oh, no, that's not what's happened. I'll tell you what's happened. The Syrians have set an ambush. They have left their camp. They've just retreated behind that first set of hills. And the first time we open up the gate, they're going to come and attack us and take us all over. And we're all going to die. And I'm going to be the first one to die. And one of the... One of the general says, you know what we should do? We should send out a little scouting party. 
we, we've got five horses left. Let's hook three up to one chariot, two to another chariot. We'll send them out. They can reconnoiter. They can see if it's true or not. If they die, well, so what? We're all going to die anyway. The king says, good plan. So still nighttime, the doors creak open and these chariots go out. Close the doors. The chariots go out tentatively out to the camp. Sure enough, there's nobody there. They can see the trail. It's not hard to track the flight of the Syrians. They've left clothing and weapons all along the way. They follow them, the, the trail all the way down to the river. They're gone. So they come back in the chariots, they come back inside, they open the gates, they come back in, they tell the king, it's true, the lepers are right, the siege has been lifted, we're saved. Well, of course, the news has run through the city and starving people are at the gate pushing to get out, including two women, one of whom a day earlier well, she has no child left, right? Should have waited one more day. At any rate, the king says to his general, General, go down and open the gate so the people can go out and get food. So the general goes down, but it's like a riot down there. And, and he gets to the gate and he throws it open. But the people in this, this mad dash for food trample the man to death. The general. And they go out and they bring back food and the marketplace is full because they have now the riches of, of Syria are now theirs. And somebody in the marketplace says, get your flour here, Twelve ba six bags of flour for one silver coin. And somebody else, 12 bags of barley, one silver coin. And so it's true what Elisha said to the general. Your eyes will see the Lord's salvation, but your lips will not taste it because you scoffed at the promise of God. You said, ah, oh, even if God were to open a window in heaven, that could never happen. And yet it did happen. And that's one part of God's big story, isn't it? the provision of God. May God bless you.